Hi guys, so today I wanted to record my adoption story, uh, my Russian adoption story. Some of you may not be interested in it because this is mostly like a beauty channel, but for the people that are, um, just keep watching. I was born in St. Petersburg, Russia. My birth parents are from Russia. Um, I lived there for a total of uh, almost six, almost seven years before I was adopted. So before I get to the adoption part, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of background of the things that I remember being with my parents, things that I remember while I was taken away from my parents, and then I'll give you insight of the adoption and what has transpired recently, new information that I have just come to find out 19 years after I was adopted and 23 years after I was taken away from my parents. So, and I'm sorry if I'm getting emotional because this is an emotional topic for me. Um, so I was born in St. In St. Petersburg, Russia on February 15th, 1992. And I was born obviously to two Russian people. My mom and dad were not married. That's one thing that I always knew. I remember um, this is when I was barely even two so it's very crazy that I remember a lot of these things people have told me there is no possible way that you can remember things at is that lipstick on my teeth anyway there's no way you can remember things at the age of two I don't remember anything uh, uh, under five yes I remember things at two I was barely two I remember being with my parents I remember my parents being so poor. I remember living in a tiny apartment with my parents that was filled with like 10 other people. Me and my mom slept on the floor. I remember this and I was like maybe barely two, two and a half. We slept on the floor next to the window. And I always got scared because in Russia there is this tale about Baba Yaga and she's like a witch that eats kids and if you're bad, she'll come and get you. So I was always scared of that. I was scared that we were by the window and the Baba Yaga was going to come get me in the middle of the night. And these are real memories that I remember. I remember um, being in that house. I think my parents were at work and like I said, there were multiple other people living there. I remember somebody sticking a cigarette into my mouth. Um, I was two, so obviously then I didn't know what a cigarette was, but thinking back now, obviously I know what it was. They stuck cigarettes in my mouth and were laughing about it like it was a joke. I don't remember if they lit it or not. Um, my parents weren't there. Um, I remember um, having only one toy and it was a set of plastic car keys. That's the only thing I had. And I remember walking in the park with my mom in St. Petersburg and I saw a mother and a daughter and this mother was flinging her daughter up in the air and catching her and they were having so much fun. And I literally remember thinking, I want that so badly. I was two years old, but I could still remember thinking, that's what I want. So I literally sprinted. I sprinted away from my mom and I sprinted towards that woman with her child. I'm sorry guys with her child that she was throwing up in the air because I wanted that type of mom so badly. And um, she, she didn't notice I was gone at first and then she realized and she came running after me 
and picked me up and of course I threw a fit because I didn't want to leave. I wanted that woman to be my mom. I just remember that. And then I know, um, I remember my parents drank heavily. I remember that at two. I remember that, which is crazy. Um, and the very, one of the, the very last memories I have, well, what a, one of the last memories I thought I had of my mom was walking down the street with her and all of a sudden a police car comes up and the police car takes me and my mom into it and we drive and obviously I'm too I don't know what's happening and the next thing I know I'm being taken out of the car and I'm being taken into a hospital I didn't know it was a hospital because I was only two I was in the hospital for weeks uh, weeks. I was in a room that was dark all the time. I was so upset. I didn't have human interaction at all. I was by myself at all time except for meal time where there was just this tiny little table and a tiny little chair where they would put food on it. And there was a crib and I was in the crib and when they would put food on the table I would obviously try to figure out how to get myself out of the crib because they wouldn't lower the crib for me. So I would have to try to figure out how to crawl out and eat. And then I remember a couple times getting in trouble, getting yelled at for crawling out of my crib to eat. But nobody was letting me out to eat. So I had to crawl out to eat. I just remember that. And I remember being there for such a long time and being alone and not knowing what was happening. I had no idea. I didn't know where my parents were. I didn't know where I was. And it was really scary. So, after those several weeks in the hospital, I was taken to a orphanage. I was there for several months. Excuse me, I'm sick and now emotional, so my nose is ready. <laughs> Excuse me. And I'm out of breath. Um, I was at that orphanage for a several for several months. I don't remember much about being there. And then I was moved to another orphanage, and that's where I remained for the four years until I got adopted. This orphanage was really great. It's not like what you would think in the movies, like they show kids being abused, at least not at the orphanage I was in. It was a very nice orphanage. It was huge. They had one of those grand ballrooms that had staircases coming up from either side. It was beautiful. We had plays. I was involved in plays. They taught me how to play the recordion, which is big in Russia. We would sing, we would do plays, people would come see us, and, oh my gosh, I'm burping, I'm sorry guys, and that was great. I lived with, I mean, at least 15, maybe 20 other children. There was only two other girls there other than me, and the rest were boys, and the girls and I quickly became friends, um... What else do I have to say about this orphanage? Um, the caretakers really did seem to care. They cared a lot about us. They cared about me. I remember one time one of the care um, caretakers asking me, do you love me? And I said yes, because she, she was taking care of me. I mean, I, I didn't really know what love was. I was really little, I didn't know, but I said yes. Because she was the one taking care of me. And so, throughout the four years that I was in an orphanage, what really, what really kicks me, and it gets me emotional every time. Literally every time I heard the door to our unit, to our orphanage unit open, I got my hopes up. I thought, this was someone coming to get me. I was finally going to get
get parents. I was finally going to be adopted. This was someone coming to get me. And every time the door closed and the person didn't come for me, nobody came for me. I was so disappointed. I was so disappointed. And I would cry because I so wanted a family. I wanted a mom. I wanted a dog. A dog. I wanted a dad. But I also really wanted a dog. And so I had a couple couples come look at me. And one couple was very interested in me. But then they um, decided that they wanted three kids instead of one. So they adopted three siblings, which was great. Because that way those three kids did not have to be separated. They could go and be together for the rest of their lives. At this time in Russia, 1998, when I was in the orphanages, well, that's actually when I was adopted. Before then, around 1992 when I was born and following those couple of years, the economy was very bad. Many people did not have money. Many children were in orphanages. Um, people would put their children in orphanages because they didn't have money. And then once they were able to get enough money, they would come get their children out. Um, they put their children into orphanages because they weren't able to feed their children. So in order to feed their children, they would put them into orphanages. But that's not, that's not exactly what happened to me. Um, so, four years go by and I'm waiting for somebody to come adopt me. And one summer in July, a couple, an American couple comes to um, see me. Um, we had two orphanages actually, a summer orphanage where we would go, there was like a lake, uh, a lake house, and we would go there and stay for the summers. And then for the crazy um, Russian winters, we would stay in the other orphanage. So in July, my these American people came to see me. They brought me all kinds of gifts. And they were also there because they were picking up a little boy, a nine-year-old boy. They were adopting him that day. And they were going to be taking him home. But they stopped by to see me because they expressed their interest in adopting me. And they really wanted to see me and to let me know that they were coming back for me. That they were going to adopt me. And I was so excited. And I was just sad that I couldn't go with them right then. I wanted to leave with them right then. Because I fell in love with them right then. I knew that they were my parents. And I, when they left, I cried. Because then I, I didn't know if they were going to come back and get me. I didn't know. I was hoping they would, but I didn't know. And then um, October rolls around and I wake up and it's a morning like any other except for they tell me that the American couple that came to see you in July, they're coming to get you today. And I was so overjoyed. I was so happy. They dressed me up in their finest little dresses. They did my hair. Um, they put bows in my hair. Um, they really try to make an impression. They really do. They try their hardest. They do your hair. They put you in the nicest dresses that like they have. They make you look presentable. So I was so excited. And I remember them walking through the door. And all I remember is running to them. I ran and I jumped in their arms. I was so excited. And I thought that they were going to take me home right away. But no, that's not the kind of people they were. They came in and they brought giant gift bags. Huge gift bags full of toys for every single one of the children that were in my orphanage, in my unit that stayed with me. All of my friends, they got huge bags of toys. One thing that I forgot to mention was in the orphanage, I had nothing that belonged to me. 
We got birthday presents from the orphanage, but they weren't mine. They were for everybody. We had a toy room and everybody had to share. I had nothing that belonged to me. Nothing at all. So my parents brought in gifts for all of these children, huge bags full of all kinds of goodies from America. And the kids were so excited. And they brought me one too, of course. Um, they, um, in July when they had visited, they had brought me a, a gift bag. They had given me this teddy bear that I really loved and a Baywatch Barbie. And I was going to pick those up um, in October when they came to give me. I was going to grab the teddy bear and the Baywatch Barbie that they had given me in July. And the caretakers um, told me not to take them and to leave them for the other children. And I was really, I was really upset. I didn't want to leave those because those were mine. My parents gave those to me. They were mine. So I was so upset because I had nothing that belonged to me. But those two things were mine. So I was really upset. But my parents had a translator. And they told the translator that it's okay. Leave them. When we get home, we'll buy you a new um, uh, Pimble. I think her name was Pimble Timsbroke. Pimble Tim's broke the teddy bear. Um, Timble Pimps broke. I don't, I don't remember her name. Um, and a Baywatch Barbie. We'll buy a new one when we get into um, when we get back to the United States. So then I was like, okay, I'll leave it here for the other children. So I'm sorry. The goodbye was an emotional. All of the people I had take care of had taken care of me were all crying. They were hugging me and. I wish I had appreciated that moment. I was so young. I was six, almost seven, so I didn't really appreciate that. I didn't I didn't appreciate all the hard work they put in to raise me from the time I was two till the time I was almost seven. I remember them just crying and telling me not to forget them and telling me that they loved me and I just wish I appreciated that more in the moment, but I was a child, so how could I? So I said my goodbyes to my friends. I was really sad to leave them because um, a girl, Svetlana, um, she had the same name as me. My name is Svetlana Vladimirova. That's my middle name. Um, and she had the same name as me, Svetlana, and I really bonded with her. She was there the entire time I was there. So, and I was sad that I was leaving because she would be the only girl. She wouldn't have anybody else. So, I said my goodbyes and we left. And um, over the next couple of days, I really got to see Russia more. I got to, um, we went to Moscow. And I got to see the St. Basil's Cathedral. I got to see all of the things that I had never been able to see in the country that I was born in. Because I was in a... I was in an orphanage. Although I have to say the orphanage did take us on field trips. They would take us places. Um, but not like that. Um, not like to the St. Basil's Cathedral, which was in a whole nother town. I just had a, I had a great time um, with my new adoptive parents in Russia. Um, we flew to California because that's where my parents were living at that point. They were living in Yorba Belinda, California. Um, and the thing that I was most excited about to get home was the dog. I had always wanted a dog. And that stems from my experience in Russia, being in the orphanage. One of my truest friends was a German Shepherd that didn't live at the uh, orphanage. He just snuck in through the gates and every day at playtime he would come running up to me and I would play with him. He would do the choo-choo train. He would put his hind legs on my shoulders and I would walk and he would walk on his hind legs. And he was, I, I loved him. I loved him so much. And then one day, um, it was around the time where they were taking me to get my passport. Um, 
we were pulling out and I saw a dead German Shepherd on the side of the street and I just knew that was my friend my my dog buddy because I hadn't seen him in a while so I knew that was probably him so um I was so excited to get dogs because um the dog the love of the dog that I had in Russia the German Shepherd um it just made me want dogs I was so excited to have a dog of my own so when we got to my house finally um I the first thing I told my parents was I want to see the dog we had two dogs, a schnauzer named Schultze and a Cocker Spaniel named Percy. And I was chasing them around. I was feeding them nerds. I was doing whatever I could to get close to them. But, of course, they were, I was crazy uh, chasing them around the freaking pool. And they were running away from me. But I had, I, I was so happy to be there. But I had a lot of behavioral issues stemming from the, um the pain that I felt, um, all the things that I went through while, um, being in Russia, while being in an orphanage, while being taken away from my parents, um, I had trust issues, um, I, I didn't like to share because I had never had anything of my own, so when I had something of my own, I did not want to share, I would not share because this was mine and I'm keeping it. I'm not sharing it because it's mine. Because I I had never had anything of my own before, and it was, I it was such like a drastic change from having nothing to living in this beautiful house in uh, Orange County. You know, having everything, it was such a difference, and I I was overwhelmed. I was happy. I was so happy to have a family. I was happy to have a brother. He had been there several months before I had. Again, he got adopted in July. I got adopted on October 10th. Um, so he had been there several months before I did. So he already knew a little English. I knew no English. I only spoke Russian. So um, it was a little hard to communicate with my parents. I got frustrated a lot and lashed out and got angry a lot because I couldn't communicate with them and they knew a little bit of Russian but they weren't fluent and I knew no English so I would get frustrated a lot while I was trying to communicate with them. But my brother did help me. Um, he knew um, just as much Russian as I did and he knew a little more English um, and he knew English some English so he could help my um help me interpret what I was saying to my parents and help my parents interpret what they're saying to me so over time um I actually learned English pretty quickly my parents were very proactive they printed out stickers um in Russian and in English and with a picture and pasted them all over the house like on the fridge it was fridge and then in Russian fridge and a picture of a fridge on chairs a uh, chair Russian word for chair and then a chair toilet a picture of a toilet the na the word toilet and then in Russian toilet like literally these were all over the house they were doing whatever they could to help me learn English I went almost immediately right into school I had a lot of trouble. I went into first grade. Um, obviously, I didn't speak good English at all. I practically only spoke Russian. I had no idea what was going on in school. I remember sitting there and I'm like, I do not understand these people. I don't know what they're saying. I, I don't know what to do. Like, I had I had no idea. I They had snack time and... I was eating my lunch during snack time because I didn't understand. So when lunch came around, I had nothing to eat because I just didn't understand. I'm sorry. I'm so sick and now that I've been kind of crying, uh, you know. So, anyways, um, back to the story. So, I learned English pretty quickly. Um... We lived in um, Orange County for about a year, and then we moved, um, well, 
let me go back. We lived in Orange County for a year when I was adopted. I had lived there for a year. My dad owned a women's uh, clothing company and famous people actually wore his clothes. They would come to his factory and get the clothes like um, before anybody else could. And I remember being in his, in his factory with all of these like all of these materials it was huge you could the materials like were like you know what do you call it all all uh like toilet paper like this but they were huge they were huge they were so big and I remember playing hide and seek with my brother, but um, famous people would come in there. Obviously, I had no idea who they were, so I wish now, I like looking back, I it was pretty cool that famous people wore my dad my dad's clothing, and that I got to experience that, even though I didn't know I was experiencing that. Um, but anyways, we ended up um, a year after that moving to Jacksonville, Florida. Um, one of my dad's um, co-workers that he had worked with lived in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, if anybody knows Fleming Island to be in fact, um, she lived there. So she showed him a house in uh, Fleming Island, which is the suburbs of Jacksonville. It's near Orange Park, if anybody's heard of it or moved or Middleburg um, and my dad bought a house in uh, Jacksonville um, so that's where I am now I'm in Jacksonville I've lived there for I've lived here for most of my life um, my parents are incredible they've been incredible to me since the day I was adopted. I was a very hard child. I had a lot of behavioral issues, like I said, because of the drama, drama, I mean trauma I had endured. I, oh my gosh, I can even remember back, like all of the, all of the things I did. I, oh, it must have been hell for them. I just know it was. I have my own child now, so I kind of understand he's not that age yet, but I, I do understand that I had behavioral issues, and I really commend them for the way that they dealed with it. They didn't, they didn't like, send me back. This child has severe behavioral issues. Send her back to Russia. They helped me deal with it. They helped me cope with it. I I now share. I, I, I don't feel the need that to you know, hog everything, um, because of my past, but I will say because of my past, I mean, my past still kind of defines me, um, some of the things that I do, um, are because of my past, uh, how do I, how do I phrase this, my past has a has affected me into my future like you never know how you're gonna affect your kids even if they're two or three you don't know what you're doing or putting them through right now and it may affect them into adulthood because i know the trauma and the experiences that i went through did affect me into adulthood i am 25 and i still deal with some of the effects um some of the things that i dealt with i still have um very small issues with them but they're still there um so be careful what situations you put your small children in or any age child because that that trauma doesn't go away it may follow them into adulthood and it may determine what type of adults they turn out to be. Luckily, I had amazing parents that raised me so well. They did whatever they could to help me. I've had an incredible life, an incredible life. But even so, I've always had like a feeling like almost like half my heart was missing because I didn't know where I came where I came from. I had no information about my parents other than their names and their birth dates on my um 
Russian birth certificate. I couldn't find any information. I had tried to look for them for years. I did that banner holding up, um, you know, a picture asking people to share it with my name, the orphanage I was in when I was born, their names, their last known address. That went nowhere. Um, so I had been searching for them for years and I always wondered, are they thinking about me? Have they forgotten about me? Like, on my birthdays, do they get sad? Do they think about me at all? Do they remember me? Or am I just the child that they forgot? Um, but then I also think they gave me up. There had to have been a good reason they gave me up. And I hold no anger towards them whatsoever. I never have. I've never had any anger towards them. And I never knew the situation as to why they gave me up until recently. And I've never been angry. I I was I was thankful. I've always been thankful that that they gave me up because of the life I have now. Because I know in Russia, I would not have the same life if I had been there, if I had stayed with them. My mother was an alcoholic. My father was an alcoholic. I would not have had the same life. I would not. And if, I, and if I had been adopted by somebody else in Russia, I mean, I don't know how my life would have been, but I know I love my life here. And I am thankful for for being adopted. I'm thankful for my parents. Shout out to Mike and Sandy Collins for adopting me and putting up for my with my shit for 25 years, almost 26 years um, in a couple of days. Well, not 26 years, 19 years. Putting up with my shit for 19 years, I'm almost 26. Um, yeah, so what was I saying? I don't remember what I was saying. So, um, I'll get into the most recent part. So, I told you how I had been looking for them for a long time with no avail. I had contacted companies in Russia and they were telling me that it was going to be like, um, you know, $5,000 if they found my parents. And it was going to be $3,000 if they found out nothing. And I was like, I can't afford that. I can't afford to do that. Like, that's that's a lot of money. Um, I just couldn't afford that. So, years went by. And several months ago, um, I I was just really feeling like I, I needed to know. I needed to know my parents. I needed to, or at least try to find them. I needed to find a relative. I needed to find somebody that knew something about my parents because I needed information. I desperately needed information about myself, where I came home from, who I came from, what happened to me, why was I placed for adoption, what happened. That's what I wanted to know. So I did the Ancestry DNA kit. And that took a while. Um, it came up with a few cousins, um, like fourth, fifth, sixth cousins, and nothing reputable. Um, I couldn't really, um, I messaged some of the people, but they were so far removed. There was almost no way that they would be able to help me. If this had been a case in the U.S., you would have gotten more hits because Ancestry is not really super worldwide yet. And a lot of people in Russia do not believe in DNA tests. They think that the government is tampering with it and they don't want to take the chance. Um, so um, I just know that Ancestry isn't as far along in other countries. So I decided to do... Um, I think it was 23 and me. It was another one. I think it was 23 and me. I'll I'll figure it out. Um and possibly uh link it in the description. Um and I got, um, I transferred my information to this other site. You can do that through, um, 
through Ancestry. You can transfer the raw data, your DNA, once it's uploaded, to another site. So when I did this, I um, a cousin came up, um, and then I also bought another DNA test from another company, and the same cousin came up. He was the closest relative to me, and he was a second to third cousin so I was getting ready to email him and he emailed me and he happened to speak English so he decided um, he was like asking me questions about my family because I guess he needed information about his family and I told him that I had been adopted I don't know anything about my parents and so I couldn't really give him information but he decided to make it his mission to help me find my parents. He made it his mission. And I can tell you this, for weeks he did research. He had people helping him do research. I, for weeks I was getting like emails of updates of, of about my parents, um, like my grandparents, even my grandparents. My grandfather was some war hero. Um, he sent me a clip in the newspaper or, um, it was a, a newspaper clip where my grandfather was a war hero. He helped end a war and he had all of these honors and medals. Um, he sent me information about my mom, I mean about my dad. He told me that I had, guess? How many siblings? I had four siblings through my dad. Two sisters and two brothers. They're, they were all older than me. And we all have different moms. So he helped me get in contact with two of my sisters. But he couldn't uh, find any contact for my two older brothers. I have spoken to my two older sisters. And they... Um, my oldest sister, she remembers um, when I was born, um, she said I think she got to see me once and never saw me again. Um, and she was always very worried about me. She wanted to know what happened to me, where did I go, how was I doing. She asked me lots of questions about my life. Um, I spoke to the other sister, you know, she also was happy that I had surfaced. Um, <laughs> and, uh, then I got the news, um, that, uh, my dad had died in 2004. Um, and that broke my heart because I didn't think that was a possibility. In my dreams, I was always going to find them. I always dreamed that I would find my parents and we would have like that immediate connection. I would get to talk to them. The one thing that I always wanted to tell them was thank you. Thank you so much for giving life to me. And thank you for giving me up. I just really wanted to tell them that. And when I found out my dad had died, it broke my heart. I didn't know what to do because I he he was a part of making me. And I just didn't know how to deal with that. It hurt. And even though I didn't know him, I remember being with him. I don't remember what he looks like, but I remember being with him and I know he was my dad. It just broke my heart. And then my cousin told me that uh, he couldn't find any information about my mom. It was like she had disappeared off the face of the earth there was like no information that could be found about her so I was kind of disappointed um and then weeks later he um contacts me again and tells me that I have a brother on my mom's side I have five siblings that I didn't know about um and the funny thing is, I actually remember him. I was two maybe under. And I always told my adoptive parents, I know I have a brother. I always told them that. I have an older brother. I always told them that. And, of course, they believed me. 
and so I I was kind of shocked when he told me you have an older brother but then again I wasn't because I always believed I did because I remember him I remember having an older brother but then I was thinking maybe he wasn't my older brother but he was so I was excited about that and I got in contact with him and he was very 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 shocked very shocked to say the least um and then um i also got the information that my mom had died several years after my dad um one or two years after my father died and that's when i really broke down that's when i really broke down because there was no hope left for me to find them i mean i had found them but not really they were gone there, there weren't going to be any of those talks I planned on having with them. I wasn't going to be able to thank them for giving me life and then giving me the life that I have now because of them. Because of them. I, 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 just, I just broke down. I didn't know how to handle the fact that they were both gone because literally and since... Since I've been adopted, I always knew that I would find them one day and that I would talk to them. Death was never a possibility. That was never something that entered my mind, ever, 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 ever. That was just not something I thought about. I never thought that would happen. And when it did, I just broke down. I was on the floor crying. I just, I was a mess. I didn't know what to do because both of my birth parents were dead. Like, what do you do with that information? It just broke me. And then I prayed, you know, and I talked to them out loud. And some people might think that's crazy, but I talked to them because even though they were dead, I was hoping that they could hear me. I wanted to thank them for giving me life, even though I couldn't do it in person or over the phone. I wanted to at least send some type of message that I was thankful for them giving me life. <coughs> so next thing is, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm sick. Next thing is my cousin found my aunt, my mom's sister. And this is where things get interesting. This is where I got all of my information from. She told me what happened, how I was put in an orphanage. So I had told you that my mom had an alcohol problem. I remember that. Apparently, she lost me um, while she was drinking. And I was on the streets of Russia by myself for days as a two-year-old. And I managed to survive by myself. And I know I blocked that out. I had to have. Because I remember a lot of things from that time. But that's the one thing I don't remember. So I know that I had to have just blocked that out. Because, you know, when traumatic things happen to you, you block them out. Um, I was on the streets for days. Um, somebody found me. Um, and asked me what, what, what my name was. And at two... I was able to tell them my full name, my first, middle, and last name, which is kind of crazy for a two-year-old. Um, they called the police. Uh, the police came and got me. Um, and this ties into what I said in the uh, beginning of the video. One of my uh, last videos of my mom was walking down the street with her. And then a, cup, a cop car pulling up and taking us. Um, in the car and then me going to the hospital but what I remember and it wasn't my mom it was a stranger it was a stranger that I remember walking down the street with when the car uh, the police car pulled up it wasn't my mom like I always thought it was a stranger we got in the car and they took me to the hospital so <coughs> that's a my aunt's mom told me. My aunt's mom told me that they called my dad 
and my dad called my mom and they told them that I had been found and I was in the hospital and that they could come pick me up or something. That I don't remember if they were allowed to come pick me up or not. But um, my aunt said that they were very scared of um, losing their jobs because of losing me. Um, they were scared of getting arrested for losing me and then losing their jobs because they were already very poor. They felt very guilty, so um, they they couldn't risk losing their jobs in already a very poor economy where they could barely sustain themselves or their child. Um, so they left me. They left me in the hospital. And they didn't come get me. I never saw my parents after um, my mom losing me. Um, so my aunt told me my mom was extremely guilt ridden. She was heartbroken. She was mortified. She didn't want to lose her job, but she didn't want to lose me either. She didn't know what to do. She was at a crossroads. She had no idea what to do. She was upset that her um, alcoholic disease lost her daughter. Um, my aunt said that they tried to get me back, but the system wasn't having it. They kept trying to push them out, and they kept trying and trying to get me, but they wouldn't let them. Um, and then they found out that a couple from America was going to adopt me, so they decided to stop fighting because they felt that I would have a better chance at life. In America than I would with them so they stopped fighting and let me go I just only wish my my parents had visited me while I was in the orphanage I never saw them they were supposed to come visit me from what I have heard they were supposed to visit me I looked through paperwork when I was being adopted it showed they never visited once. They never send the child money. They were supposed to send money for food and things like that. Or send anything clothes. They never sent anything. They never came to see me. Um, I understand them not sending money because they were very poor. They lived in an apartment with like 10 other people. They could barely sustain themselves. The only toy I had was a plastic set of keys. Um, so I don't blame them for that. I just wish that they would have visited me. But my aunt said was it was too hard for my mom. It was too hard for her to come see me because of what she had done. She felt guilty for what she had done. And she couldn't. After losing me because of her alcoholism, she couldn't come see me. But she was always planning on trying to get me back. But, you know, once America came up into the topic, they just stopped fighting. They chose to stop fighting. And, um, uh, so she said, um, my mom obviously loved me very much. She talked, she talked about it a lot, um, my aunt didn't know my dad very well, um, so she couldn't talk much about him. Um, she said she talked on the phone with him a couple times, like when I was in the orphanage. She would she called him and was like, your child is in the orphanage. I'm going to try to go get her out, uh, like type of stuff. Um, my aunt tried to help me um, get out of the orphanage, tried to help my mom and dad. Um, but otherwise, she didn't really have much contact with my dad. Um, <coughs> so, um, anyways, what was I saying? The whole point was she loved me and she was very upset. Um, what I do know is the custody hearing thing that they had in Russia, my dad went to when they had to sign over their parental rights when I was getting, um, adopted. Um, my dad showed up to court. My mom did not. My father told the judge that when my mother found out that I was being adopted, she ran and he couldn't find her. She was just so upset that she just ran and nobody could find her. And that, 
that breaks my heart. That breaks my heart for her because I'm a mom now and I can't imagine that. I can't imagine what that feels like, you know. I really can't imagine what that feels like. But I ended up stopping. They stopped fighting for me. They stopped fighting so that I could have a better life. And I did have a better life because of it. So I'm thankful to them. I'm not angry at my mom. Most people would be angry that their mom lost them when they were an infant. Well, a toddler of two. And left and didn't go out and find them. I'm not angry. I'm not angry. I love her. She's my mom. She gave birth to me. I'm not angry. I love her. And, uh, you know, I, j I just wish things um, could have been different as far as seeing her. You know, her coming to visit me. But other than that, I don't blame anybody. I don't blame anybody. I don't blame my mom. I don't blame my dad. I don't blame my aunt. I don't blame anybody. It's nobody's fault. I'm I'm just very happy. I'm happy I got adopted um, into this incredible family. And if it wasn't for being adopted, I wouldn't have an incredible, beautiful baby boy. His name is Aiden. And at the end of this month, January 28th, he's going to be two. And I'm so blessed to have him. And I know that if I hadn't been adopted, I wouldn't have him. And he's the most incredible thing in my life. And I I do parent a little differently because of some of the things that I experienced in my past. Um, I can't really, it's hard to elaborate, but I do parent differently and I do things differently than some people because of the things that I have experienced, especially at such a young age, I appreciate my parents a lot more than most children do. Every year on my adoption anniversary, I write them a love note on Facebook for the public to see how much I love them every year because I appreciate them so much. I appreciate everything they've done for me. I appreciate them for loving me even though when I wasn't so lovable even though I was screaming I hate you at them you're the worst parents in the entire world they still loved me they gave me a chance at life they gave me a new life they gave me a chance to start over and because of them I have the life I have now and because of them I have a beautiful baby boy and they have a grandson that they are very proud of. I, sorry, this is moving. I love seeing them with my son. Um, um, one of the things that I, when I was pregnant, I decided I wanted to have my, both of my parents in the labor and delivery room because, um, my mom, obviously, she adopted us, so she had never given birth. And my dad, he had a daughter from a previous marriage. But back then, they did not allow the fathers in the room to see their children being born. So I thought it would be really special for them to be able to experience childbirth. So I wanted both my dad and my mom there. And also because they are my biggest supporters they comfort me when I'm sad and upset and I knew they would be the perfect people so they were there when their grandson was born they were cheerleaders they were cheering me on and they got to experience childbirth um, even though they have children but they didn't you know my mom has children but she didn't give birth to them but at least she got to experience what it would have been like and trust me, she's lucky she didn't have to experience childbirth because that was one of the most traumatic things I have ever experienced. Holy shit, I'm not even exaggerating. The pain was crazy. And my mom took pictures. Oh, my mom was all up in my crotch with the video camera and the pictures. Making sure to not document every single little thing I looked through her computer and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, 
Oh my God. Whoa, mom. But uh, she was excited. You know, she'd never experienced that before. And I was happy to allow my parents to experience something like that. And most people wouldn't want their dads in the room with them to give birth, but he's my dad. I mean, he's never got to experience it. So why would I exclude him? I wouldn't. He's one of my biggest supporters. So why shouldn't he be there to see his grandson be born? He should. He, he's done everything for me. I mean, I wouldn't be here without him or my mom. So why would I exclude them from one of the biggest moments of my life? You know? So, I'm so sorry I'm getting so emotional because this is just, it's a very personal thing. And it's a very emotional thing for me, this story. It's, it's a crazy story. But it's a story of love. And it's a story of resilience. Because I've been able to bounce back, but things of my past still do affect me. So just word of advice to anybody out there that has children. Like I said before, the things that you do now can affect your children's lives as they get older. You could... What you're doing now could cause issues for them when they get older. Like, what's happened to me? I mean, mine aren't extreme. They're small, itty-bitty things. I've never really trusted people easily because of what I experienced. I, I mean, I share, but I still have that, this is mine instinct. This belongs to me. This is mine. You know, because when I was in the orphanage, I had nothing. Even before when I before I was in the orphanage, I had nothing. So I still have several things that I need to, you know, try to work on. Some things that still affect me from being a child, from being a toddler, from the things I experienced. So, but anyway, this is a happy story because it ended up well. I have incredible parents such incredible parents that did such an incredible thing to come to Russia and adopt two kids, spent a fortune of money flying there and back four or five times and, you know, loving us every step of the way, every mistake that we've made. And we have made a lot of mistakes. They've loved us every step of the way. And this is a story from an adoptee what it's like, I guess, to be an uh, adoptee. Well, at least, um, what it's like for me. I know every story is different. Every, you know, not everybody gets lucky when they get adopted, but I did. I got lucky with the most incredible parents in this entire freaking world. So, anyways, that is my adoption story. So if you guys have any questions at all, just, um, you know, comment them down in the comments section. And I really appreciate you guys for watching. Thank you. And I'll see you in the next